morning, neighbors. Good morning. All right. It's so great to see you all this morning. I'm glad to be with you all. If we haven't met yet, my name is Andy Woodworth, and I'm one of the pastors here. I use she and they pronouns, and I'm excited for this morning of worship. We're getting started with a new series today, um, and Angie will say more about these things as we go, but we're diving into a change of gear because we're getting ready for a change of year. We're coming to the conclusion of 2023 and looking forward to whatever is beyond. And so friends, I invite you, as we come into this place this moment, this morning, maybe you need to take a moment to change the gear, to change how you're showing up. Maybe, let me put it this way, however you're showing up is just fine. I don't need you to be a different way but I invite you as you come into this place to pause for a second. Will you take a deep breath with me? Friends, I hope that you found everything that you need as you came into this place, that you found coffee or snacks, that you have found a worship guide, that if you need restrooms, that you found them, they're through these doorways and to the left. Also, I hope that you found some warm friends to greet you and um, maybe the warmth of long community or the spark of new community. I hope that you found what you need as you come to this place today. But friends, as we get started this morning, we're going to sing our heart out. What a great way to change the gear. We're going to sing our heart out with this song that I just love deeply. I hope that you appreciate it as well. Let's sing together, friends, as we feel able. And I invite you to stand as you feel led, as you feel able, as you feel equipped. As we sing together, Great Are You, Lord.
Neighbors, I hope that you have found what you need. Again, I'm so glad that you're with us this morning. Hope you found a worship guide. If we haven't met yet, my name is Andy Woodworth. I'm one of the pastors here. I use she and they pronouns. Welcome to Neighborhood Church. Um, And also, welcome to all of our friends and neighbors that are joining with us online. We hope that you're finding what you need. I think Kylan is our digital minister, and Kylan is dropping into the chat all these fun links for you so that you have a copy of the worship guide and can follow along as well. Friends, will you take another deep breath with me? As it turns out, you can never have too many deep breaths, right? (laughs) The world is so busy. There's so much happening and happening and happening. It's hard to find the time to take a deep breath and to process all that's happening in the world and in the inner world of you sometimes, maybe, if you're like me. Maybe you've got it all figured out. If so, praise God. But if you're like me, it takes a little bit of time just to figure it all out. And so, friends, I hope that you find that this time, the time that we have together, is a time for us to find some stability, something stable, something to put our hands on and to touch in a world of uncertainty. So, friends and neighbors, I hope that you are able to show up here as yourself. I hope that you know that all of who you are is welcome here. All of who you are is welcome here as we continue in our worship. Friends, as time rolls on, there is this deep hope that we have that someday, maybe this day, we will all be free. So friends, let's continue in our worship. There's a world and more caught in suffering, silent casualties. Oh, God, grant us peace in these sleepless nights. I can hardly breathe despite brutality. I know.
Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. I'm Angie Woodworth. I'm one of the other pastors here. I use she and her pronouns, and I am so glad to get to be in worship with you this morning. Um, As we continue in worship, I'd love to invite the kids to come down front um, and chat with me if they would like. Um, Someone has just left this beautiful, hmm? Ian? Oh, Ian left this beautiful drawing for us. Um, Thank you, Ian. I'm going to move it so I don't lose it. But we keep enjoying it week after week. I guess if it were one of the kids, we would say we'll put it in the office somewhere. Maybe we should hang, should we hang Mr. Ian's drawing in the office too? We hang y'all's drawings. I guess it would be nice, huh? Yeah, maybe we should. All right, I'm going to stand up today so I can show the grown-ups a thing too. But I just want to ask um, if you notice anything different today in the room than before. Yeah. There's blue lighting. There is. What was it before? <clears throat> kind of red, yellow, golds. Yeah. What else do you notice? There is. There's blue cloth on the altar table. You're right. Why do you think we made these changes? Yeah. It is almost winter, sort of. Yeah. And it feels colder outside, right? Why else might we make these changes? Yeah. It is getting colder. Hmm? Ooh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, yeah. Um, so you are talking about the holiday calendar, and you're talking about the seasons, nature calendar, and part of what I want to talk about today is the church calendar. So, way to help me with that. Um, do you know what the church calendar is called? You can guess. Ooh, close. Liturgical calendar. The liturgy is the, the framing of church, the stuff we do in church, um, the flow and rhythm of church that we all do together, right? It's called the work of the people. So the church calendar is the liturgical calendar because it's the church work of the people, right? So what colors do you see? Yeah. Yellow, purple, black, blue, lots of green, a little bit of red, a little bit of white. Yeah, what? Light blue or blue? Yeah. Yeah, so this is like, I put Christmas as like white and gold together because it can be both. Like technically it's white, but we often use a lot of gold too. Um, If you see a liturgical calendar that tells you that, um, also if you're online and watching online, you can look up something called the liturgical calendar and there's all kinds of pictures online. This is one you can print out and color yourself, all kinds of things. But just if you see a liturgical calendar that says Christmas color is red or green, That's wrong. It's probably from a non-liturgical tradition, may have been created by the Baptists, which is fine. They can do that if they want. They're just not a very liturgical tradition. The liturgical color is white, um, because red represents blood, right? And the Holy Spirit, which is good, but not Christmas. That's like holly, that's like a secular thing. But Christmas is is white, okay, Um, or gold. So, where do you think we are, given what you just said about what you see in the room, um, in the Christian year? Yeah, at the blue part. So, here's a, here's a sneaky trick. We're sort of playing a sneaky trick on you. We're not technically quite there yet. We're going to do like a lead-in. Does anyone know what the season of blue is called? Yeah. The season that blue's the color? Winter's the nature season it happens in. No. No. It is the sea, the four, what? Advent. Good reading. It's hard to read on there, right? Advent. And Advent is the four Sundays that lead up to Christmas. Do we have four Sundays to Christmas? They're really fast doing math in their head. They're like, all their faces just went, are we that close to Christmas? Is it really that close? It's not. Don't panic. Don't get, I mean, you're, you didn't miss a whole chunk of the calendar. It's a little more than that, maybe. Is it 28 days? I think, oh, this would be 28 days. We have more than that, though, because it's only November 12th today. So here, we're actually at the very end of the green, but do you see where I have this arrow right between the green, which is called ordinary time? Um, and the blue. Advent is the beginning of the Christian year. That arrow is where we start over. Do you know what the calendar year changeover is? What's the start of a new calendar year in our culture? Um, 
December 31st is the end, and January 1st, yeah, New Year's, right? January is the start of a new year. The seasons of nature don't really have a start. They just go, right? It's just cycles of this. Um, But Advent, which is before the calendar new year, starts the new Christian year, and we wait for the coming of Jesus, right? So we're actually going to do like a pre-start to Advent. We're going to do three weeks of like lead up to Advent, Because Advent is about watching and waiting and hoping and getting ready. And usually by the time December gets here, we're so busy and there's so many things to do and we're already in full Christmas mode and blah, and we kind of miss some of it, right? So we're going to transition slowly over the next few weeks and you'll see more and more blue come in and our set will change a little bit to remind us of Advent. And then on the first Sunday in December... December 3rd, when Advent actually starts, we'll have a whole Advent altar and our Advent wreath and all the things that we have to get ready for Christmas. How about that? Does that sound good? Yeah, I thought it sounded cool too. We did do a little nativity play this year, pop-up pageant, and I assume that's happening again this year. Um, I should tell y'all one other thing that the grown-ups got an email about. But one thing that's happening soon for me and my own calendar Um, is that I'm going to take something called renewal leave, and I'm going to take some time off from work to rest and to recenter and to do some re-putting things back together in my life and in my brain in a good way work. And so I'm not going to be preaching or leading worship after next Sunday. Like, next Sunday will be my last Sunday until February. I'll be around, and I'll come to church. And you might see me on Christmas Eve, and if there's a pop-up pageant, I'll definitely come watch you for that. But I'm just going to be, like, sitting out there, like, with, like, a normal human and not doing all this. So I'll be around. But, and Pastor Andy will be here, and Kylan will be here, and Kelly will be here. All your church leaders will be here. All your grown-ups will be here. I'm just going to not be up here for a few months. Yeah, like, right there. I don't actually know. I... I have no idea where one could sit. I might sit in a different seat every time because I always sit right there. I have no idea what the view's like from back there. Weird, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. So Advent, the actual Advent is the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And this year that starts December 3rd. And actually, it's a little tricky because Christmas Eve is the fourth Sunday of Advent and Christmas Eve. That's right. Um, And then, but we're over here. We've got three more Sundays in this green time, in the ordinary time, the counted time leading up. Yeah. So confusing. Christmas Eve is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and then Christmas um, Day is on a Monday this year. Mhm. 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 The third Sunday of Advent, you'll you should be starting your Christmas break. Mhm. That's right. You get two weeks, and maybe even like two weeks plus a day, because the way New Year's falls. Yeah. It's not, it's green. Um, and it, so we've got three Sundays in this green part leading up, and we're just going to pretend that they're like the on-ramp to Advent, the entry point to Advent. How about that? The transition. Yeah. <clears throat> the green marks all the time of the year that is, we call it ordinary time, but that doesn't mean it's just plain. It means it's counted. They call it the first Sunday after, um, sometimes there's actually some green in here too. Um, And they call it the first Sunday after Epiphany and the third Sunday after Epiphany. But sometimes we just keep that whole thing gold. This one, they'll be like the first Sunday after Pentecost, the fourth Sunday, the 18th Sunday, the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. So they're ordered or counted days. So we call them ordinary time. And they're the times when we just learn about Jesus being alive on earth. Yeah. Ooh, Epiphany. We'll talk about that soon. Um, there's so much to talk about. If y'all want to take this, and also maybe you can talk about it during Grow Kids today after church. So if y'all want to take this and take it to Grow Kids with you, you may. Could we have a prayer though? There is a whole podcast about liturgical seasons on our Neighborhood Conversations podcast. Um, they're some of my favorites. All right, let's pray. 
God, you are good, and you gave us wonderful, inquisitive minds and so many ways to mark time. We have calendars that our whole culture follows. We have the seasons of nature that show us how time is passing and your creation is letting go to be prepared to renew itself. And we have this calendar we follow together as the cycle of the church year, where we learn and wait and listen for you. God be with us, because time is confusing and hard sometimes. And sometimes we just don't quite know what to do. So I pray that you will be with us, and that you will remind us that no matter what questions we have or what things we know or don't know, that you are always with us and that you love us every moment of every day, no matter what the time, no matter what the season. In Christ's name, amen. All right, guys, go find a place to worship. Do you weave yourself into the fabric of who I am? The light of every pressing dawn you make me forget. And I believe, even when it feels like I don't know who I should be, from the gospel according to Matthew this morning. If you can rise as spirit or in body as you were able to honor the reading of the gospel. I'll be reading from chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Jesus teaches, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten young bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Now five of them were wise and the other five were foolish. The foolish ones took their lamps but didn't bring oil for them. But the wise ones took their lamps and also brought containers of oil. When the groom was late in coming, they all became drowsy and went to sleep. But at midnight there was a cry, look, the groom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamp. But the foolish bridesmaids said to the wise ones, give us some of your oil because our lamps have gone out. But the wise bridesmaids replied, no, because if we share with you, there won't be enough for our lamps and yours. We have a better idea. You go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the groom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding, and then the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep alert because you don't know the day or the hour. For reasons I do not fully understand, this is the word of God for all of us who are the beloved children of God. Will you say thanks be to God? You can have a seat as we pray. God of all readies, nevers, and everything in between, it is hard for us to sit with uncertainty We do not know if it's too late to prepare. We do not even know exactly how to get ready. As we worship today, as we listen today, dwell with us in this uncertain time. Meet us in the space between always and never. Help us name our grief for what's past and our hope for what's to come. Amen. It's resurrection baked into the fabric of the plan Like season's tides and even the revolutions of the land And I believe Even if it's something that I'll never live to see Oh, I believe We can know that's good
Amen. Um, we love this song that we discovered in working on this, um, and I hope you will come to love it. We will be singing it. And I'm glad we have that because I do not love this text. Does anyone, this is like their favorite Bible passage? Yay, I love when Jesus slams the door in the face of people. Um, I don't know why Jesus would teach this, honestly. Um, and the setting for this is it's the last week of Jesus' life, and he knows the ending. He knows he's going to, like, die, but he also knows he's going to be raised again. He's tried to teach the disciples this. Um, but somehow he teaches this. Okay, so if Jesus is fully God, fully human, like, I believe that there's some human tendencies, right? So is, like, anxiety just taking over? Is worry taking over? Is this the part of him that's starting to churn that last week that leads to the prayer in the garden? Like, God, please make this not happen. I'll do it if I have to, but take it away if you can. I don't know. Does he just want to be sure that his people are paying attention? I keep trying. I mean, I, I just don't know. I honestly don't know. And it worries me because it seems so bad. But I was trying to think, and I was thinking about being in the car with my boys the other day, and just a benign day coming back from running errands or coming from my mom's house or something. We were just riding down College Avenue, and I started saying, hey, do you, let's practice. You know my number, and you know Nana's phone number because our phone numbers are one number apart, which is really easy to remember. Do you know Zazie's phone number? Oh, cool. Do you know our street address? Things that they know. They've known for a while now, right? And so, like, if you were somewhere with your friends and had a crisis, what would you do? So we just kind of play that out, right? These are just kind of normal parenting conversations to check in about every now and then when it's not a crisis, right? Just practice. And now that they're older, we don't do it quite so often. I said, well, what if none of us could answer? What would you do? Who else would you call? Now that they all have cell phones, we started talking about how you can put I-C-E, ICE, for in case of emergency, right, in your contacts, and you could put it by as many people as you want so that if an emergency responder needed to call someone. We talked about people they could go to, other people who they could text or call or try to get a number for someone else. We talked about how you can call the church, right, or tell someone to look up the number. We talked about all these things. And of course, my hope is that my children are never in a situation where they need the fourth, fifth, sixth backup plan, right? I'm gonna do literally everything in my power to make sure that never happens. And I want them to be prepared for if it ever does, right? So is this text like that for Jesus? Is he just like so worried, and wanting to just make super sure they get how important it is? I don't know, is he unsure himself? I hate the idea that he's sowing uncertainty in them. But today's theme is the uncertain time. And this is in our new series, like I was explaining to the kids. It's going to be seven weeks. It's going to be the four weeks of Advent, but these three weeks leading up to it. Um, and it's called Out of Time. And it will take us all the way through Advent, waiting for the coming of Jesus. And where we remember and celebrate Jesus' birth long ago, right? But we also remember and prepare in this liturgical season for the promise that Christ will come again. It's both a season, it's a, like a both and season, right? And it's the start of the Christian year. And we're starting our lead up a little early because it's important. And I. I love these liturgical seasons, right? Um, I really love them because they help us practice life, right? These seasons, when we spend focusing on something, we, we practice when those seasons of life will come up, even if they're not true right now. And Advent is the season where we practice the parts of life where we're having to hold watching and waiting and not knowing what comes next. But with Advent, there's this glimmer of hope, holding on to this bit of hope. And purple, a royal color, has been a traditional color of Advent, but as the kids pointed out, many Christian traditions have incorporated this blue color, this kind of deep blue, and this little piece of velvet is kind of my favorite blue color for Advent. Um, 
And it's this, you'll hear, you've hear, heard us say this a million times before if you've been here other years, but this color of the, the blue that's the sky just before dawn, right? The darkness is still there. The, it, you still can't see very much, but you can see that light is coming. And you'll see our worship space shift over the next few weeks. Um, and this year, as we wait and hold on to hope, we're going to be pondering time. And out of time helps us consider the reality of times in life when we are, like, feeling out of time, right? Like time crunch or urgent or it's too late or the time crunch is coming. But also... It's going to remind us that even in those moments, God exists beyond time, right? In this space outside of our constructs of time or understandings of time. And the Greek word for that is kairos, right? Kairos versus chronos or chronological time, right? So we're going to ponder all of that. And there's definitely space for uncertainty and unknowing, but it's... It's like Jesus is trying to say something to his disciple about, disciples about the uncertainty of time in this text. And like, we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know when. Because time is often uncertain, right? And we know more than ever, I feel like, the last few years that even if we think we know the time frame something's going to happen, it just might not. It could pivot at any moment. Um, and I think some of us still have a little bit of like, I mean, for me, that causes like a little physical anxiety about that because it's just hard to count on much of anything long term these days. So we have seasons of that when we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know when. You've all felt that, right? Jobs, new jobs, promotions, applying for school or applying for scholarships, waiting to see if a new plan will fill out or medical diagnoses. Like, it's really horrible to get a bad diagnosis. And sometimes it's almost as hard to get a, well, it's hard to know. We'll keep watching and testing and wait and see. The unknowing is sometimes as hard as knowing bad news. Relationships, dating, chain. <laughs> brother. Um, changing with your partner across long-term relationships, children, infertility. There is so much uncertainty just in our lives. And then if you even, if you look beyond yourself to any part of the world, there's more, right? In the larger world, injustice that's hard to fight and climate change and violence and war, the unknown and the uncertainty can be overwhelming. And y'all, I don't know what on earth or maybe in heaven Jesus is trying to teach in this text. Is he trying to say, it's hard sometimes, but be ready or else? That doesn't sit right to me, right? Jesus doesn't feel like an or else kind of guy to me. Um, and when we don't know what to, Scripture is saying, one of the things we can do is to zoom out to see the larger scope of Scripture and consider the whole of Scripture. And I believe the, the core message of Scripture that God is a God of love and Jesus is that love embodied. And if that's true, then a teaching of or else doesn't fit. Handy though, in those lectionary seasons of um, the green color, the texts in the lectionary, which is kind of a guideline for how you can read scripture in its most parts in about three years, um, and we use that as our basis for worship. In the green part, the scripture texts aren't always connected, but when you get into those um, seasons where it's different colors, they are interconnected. So we're gonna use those handy tools of interconnected thematic scriptures to see maybe what a larger purpose might be. And that's why we're gonna put all the texts, list them in your worship guide for this series so you can look at them if you get a wild hair to do that. Um, so let's see what this has to say. I'm not going to read them all to you in their entire, entirety, 
But the Old Testament text, there's always an Old Testament text, a psalm, a gospel, which is the first four books of the New Testament, and then another reading from the New Testament, right? Um, So the Old Testament text today is Amos, who was a prophet. And the heading in this, chapter 5, starting at verse 18, sometimes the scripture um, translators and editors put these headings in to give you a guide. This one is a statement of divine disgust. This is such a great passage of scripture that I'm just going to read this to you. Doom to those who desire the day of the Lord. Okay, pause. All of these texts, because of Advent, because of whatever, the theme, the uncertainty, are about preparing for the coming of God, the day of the Lord, right? When God comes, or in Christian tradition, comes again. So that's what they're talking about. Doom to those who desire the day of the Lord. What do you want the day of, why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear or sought refuge in a house, rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Does not sound pleasant. Isn't the day of the Lord darkness, not light, all dark with no brightness in it? I hate. I reject all of your festivals. I don't enjoy your joyous assemblies. If you bring me your entirely burned offering and gifts of food, I won't be pleased. I won't even look at your offerings of well-fed animals. Take away the noise of your songs. I won't listen to the melody of your harps. But... Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amos was having a big feelings day, (laughs) right? Um, So in this uncertainty piece, right, the what will it look like for God to come again and restore all things, Amos has this view, at least in this moment, right, of like, it's too late. We already blew it, y'all. And in this moment, he's talking to the church, the religious institution, right? Right? He's just got this, it's too late. All right? Different than Jesus, maybe. Then we go to Psalm, and the Psalms are are poems and literal songs written usually to um, represent a particular emotion and feeling to God. They're very personal. And this one is crying out for help. Help me, God, I'm completely overwhelmed. I'm entirely in despair. I can't get out of bed. I'm stuck under the covers. I'm terrified for my future. I need your help. And there's this little glimmer of hope that God will actually help. And then we've, you know, we've read the gospel one. I don't know. And then we go to Paul and his letter, his first letter to the church in Thessalonica, um, the Thessalonians, and he's got this promise about what will happen when the day of the Lord comes, and it's super happy and super hopeful, and everybody don't worry, everything's good. In part of it, he says, this is because the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the signal of a shout by the head angel and a blast on God's trumpet. First, those who are dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are living and still around will be taken up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. That way, we will always be with the Lord. So encourage one another with these words. Very different very different tone. Um, now, side note, just a little side note, um, in Methodist theology, Wesleyan tradition, we don't believe in, um, in the rapture, that like people will get snatched up and other people will be left behind. That's not how we believe it happens. And this image of going up in the clouds, we don't believe that's like a permanent thing. We believe in the idea that like when restoration and recreation comes, that it happens here on earth in creation, that God comes and does that here on earth. So, Just so you know, we believe there's something that happens in eternity, but we don't know, and it's not that scary rapture left behind stuff. Um, We can talk more about that if you want, but that's not our personal belief. So um, these are all very different approaches, right? We've got uh, Amos saying, it's too late. The psalmist saying, like, I'm completely overwhelmed and I don't know what to do, but maybe you could help. And then Jesus saying, whatever Jesus is saying, I don't know, get ready, It'll be great if you're ready. If not, I don't, I don't know. And then we've got Paul saying, it's going to be great, guys. Don't worry. Don't, you don't have to worry. Everything's, it's never too late. Everything's fine. So what if, and I don't know that this is the answer. We can talk about it. We can, like, debate about it. Just because I'm up here in this stool doesn't mean I have all the answers, because I don't. But what if... 
there's no one right way to wait for God to do God's next thing, and there's no one right way to live into uncertainty and unknowing. And what if scripture is not simply an instruction manual or a book of answers, but what if it's a collection of people's stories about how they've experienced and encountered God and how they've tried to engage in God's work in the world? And what if being a Christ follower means figuring out how to live with uncertainty about so many things, even how and when God does what God does, Sometimes we might feel like Amos, and we individually or as a society or as an institution have totally blown it, and it's too late, and there is more anger than anything else. That's fair and not wrong. What if sometimes we're like the psalmist, crying out for help, stuck under the covers, completely overwhelmed, and yet somehow holding on to that shred of hope that maybe God is real? And maybe God cares about us. Or maybe sometimes we're like Paul, holding on to this imminent hope for all to be well, even when the world around us is sometimes full of turmoil and pain. Maybe sometimes getting into the, it's never too late. Everything's going to be okay. Even to the point of denial or complacency. And what if Jesus, maybe, in his own human side, has some anxiety and care, but is trying to help us stay engaged, to not give up hope, but also not to be in a mindset that our hope in God makes us stop engaging in life now, or in the pain around us now? Maybe this Advent practice of recognizing and living in uncertainty is recognizing the hardest parts of what Spanish priest John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul, or maybe the dark night of our collective humanity or our society or the dark night of our world, and at the same time holding on to hope that, like modern prophet Andre Henry says, it doesn't have to be this way if we resist. Victoria Larson, who helped uh, create this worship series, were um, using points out that uncertainty occupies this middle ground between either end of the spectrum. Right between the it's already too late apathy and paralysis and despair and the never too late. We always have possibility and time that might lead us to blind optimism or complacency. And she reminds us that when we cannot know what the future holds and we can honestly acknowledge both the power of our choices, right, our ability to participate, but also the limits of our influence, then this in-between space and the future, whether that's the biblical day of the Lord or the big struggles of our world or the heartache and pain of our denomination or the unknowns in our own lives, that future becomes something for God to enter into. There is space for God to show up with us because it's not something we can control. If we have released control, but stay engaged, then God can show up with us and we can co-create together between these two extremes. Because y'all, that's what God does. God shows up with us in the hardest times, in the most uncertain times, in the most vulnerable, in the most scary times, and gets ready and gets to work. And our part is to get ready and to make room, to not get caught in the it's too late already, or the, we don't have to do anything, God will repair everything eventually, or there's always more time. Like in those emergency prep combos with my kids, they can't control everything that might happen, and I don't want them to think that they ought to. That kind of stress and anxiety is not helpful. But they can work to know their plans, what they can know, have some framework to live out of and trust that there's a whole team of adults who are doing everything in their power to keep them safe and help them know they are loved. 
Victoria Larson describes this in-between engagement, even in the midst of uncertainty. And she says that cultivating and living into uncertainty is hard and beautiful work. And it might look like a Christian who vacillates between doubt and faith, doing their best to know it's not good enough, like doing their best and knowing that that's not good enough, but that God's grace might be. Knowing they can never change the whole world, but not quitting because maybe God can make it more than we can imagine. It looks like a creative world that is groaning with the pain of human-caused climate change, yet still believing that there's a possibility for restoration and resurrection and contributing to that a little bit every day. It might look like a congregation that doesn't see a whole future for itself, but uses to, chooses to use its resources to invest in a future beyond what it can imagine. The uncertainty that Jesus offers us does not nudge us towards paralysis or towards apathy, but towards active participation in the world that God is trying to shape. We usually call that the kingdom of God, right? What can we do every day, even in the midst of the uncertainty, to add a little bit to the kingdom of God? Because this is God's ministry of uncertainty. God's promise to be there and active in love. And our participation in the work of love can make a difference. We don't have to know much for sure. We can have so many questions. And some days participating may look like staying in bed and taking care of yourself. And some days, participating might look like holding on to hope beyond hope and fighting the power of injustice, even with your physical body. We don't have to know all the answers. We just have to know what our next step is to live out love a little bit every day and to believe that God will show up with us and that love, even our little bits of it, can make a difference. May it be so, friends. May it be so. A little bit of time. Take a few moments to breathe deeply and to listen to what God might be saying to you. Friends and neighbors, God, the one who has made us, the one who made the starlit sky, this God blesses you. God blesses you. Will you turn to a neighbor and say, God blesses you? Jesus, our Redeemer, the one who arrives just at the right time, blesses you. Jesus blesses you. Will you turn to your neighbor or drop in the chat this phrase, Jesus blesses you? Jesus blesses you. The Holy Spirit, our enlivener, the one who sparks hope for the hopeless, blesses you. The Holy Spirit blesses you. Will you say this? The Holy Spirit blesses you. The Holy Spirit blesses you. You are blessed in the name of the God, the three in one, and all God's people said, amen and amen. This time has been you all this time, yeah. All this time has been you all this time, yeah. All this time has been you all this time. 
if we have not had the opportunity to meet, I am Kylan, Director of Restorative Practices here, and I use he and him pronouns, and, um, and here for our moment of response, where we continue to reflect on all that we have heard um, and experienced into day service. Um, I'm also going to invite the choir, if you want to come on up and get into um, position at this time, that would be great. Um, friends and neighbors, it is super exciting. Today after church, we will be having Grow Kids. Um, that will be until 2.30 p.m., so that starts right after service, and they can meet you right here in the sanctuary. Super excited for our Grow Kids to continue. Um, also, friends and neighbors, I am looking for some volunteers, some bakers, some people of that nature. Um, our Part of our justice work is the way in which we show up in community. Um, so for some time now, you all have probably seen the events that we have been participating in called Youth Belong. It is an initiative of the National Civil and Human Rights Museum and their LGBTQIA, the LGBTQ Institute, um, and the work that they are doing um, to support not only queer and trans youth, but the children of queer and trans parents. Um, and so this week, um, Thursday the 16th from 6 to 8 p.m., we are going to be hosting um, Youth Belong at the Table, a Friendsgiving celebration. We know that the holidays um, for this particularly marginalized people can be difficult for a lot of folks and so a lot of kids and so we want to make sure um, that we are showing up and so Neighborhood has um, volunteered ourselves and our space and um, all of those things to be able to share space with those children um, and those families on this Thursday from 6 to 8. Um, and so if you would like to sign your children up for that, you can go um, to the neighborhood, you go to our website and under the happenings page, there's a link that you can register for. If you would like to volunteer, to just be here in this space, to share love with those people, to meet some of our other amazing partners that will be here. Um, we are also responsible, they are catering in dinner, but they have asked us if we would do a potluck style dessert table. Okay, so if you would like to bake a dessert or something of that nature, say you don't have time to bring it, if you wanna drop it off Wednesday, my schedule's a little open this week, and so if I need to swing by the house and pick it up, friends, I'm beckoning you, I am asking you at this time to join me in community, okay? They say, ask for what you need. So I'm asking, I am inviting you to join me in community to be community for others, all right? To go outside and to show other folks the goodness um, of God, but also the goodness of true community um, and genuine friends and neighbors during this time. So if you're able to do that, you can grab me after church, you can email me, you can call me. Also, for all of our friends who signed up to be a part of a justice or a community ministry team, on Je December the 3rd at 1230, you should have received an email from me this week, we'll be having our annual retreat. And so this is to plan out our entire 2024 year. Again, I'm asking for what it is we want, asking for what we need. I need you to come and to participate in the planning of our year and to really, um, as we are doing that as well, we are going to be um, looking at what is the time commitment of this particular ministry? What if I come host an event? How long do I have to be there? How many meetings are we responsible to attend? We have all of those things lined out for you so you can begin to plan and look accordingly. Oh, I have capacity in my life for an additional two, two hours a month or two hours a week or something of that nature. So friends, we are um, excited as we continue to do this work and ask you to respond in these ways and so many others. Prayer wall is here in the back corner. And at this time, I'm going to invite Whitney up, um, who's a part of our generosity team, to continue. Hi neighbors, if we haven't met, my name is Whitney Brown. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and like Kylan said, I'm part of the generosity team. And I'm just gonna make a quick caveat. I am a professional fundraiser, and so if I call it the stewardship committee, stewardship in my land means thank you. And so this is really our opportunity to thank all of you for the many, many ways that you're generous with the congregation. Um, the ways that you're generous with your time, with your talent, and your treasure. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a table that's right behind Mary. Will you wave? Mary Pope, will you wave? Right behind Mary. Um, we're going to have a table that Ian is pointing to now that will have someone from the generosity team, me, Ian, Rachel, um, to talk to you, thank you for your support, and show you some of the different ways that you can give of your time and talent and treasure generously. So that could be, there is a card over there 
that um, you can fill out with your name and contact info, and it talks about different ways that you can be generous with your resources, which could be volunteering for things like Grow Kids today, um, or serving on the generosity team. There's also a sheet over there that talks about um, the sheet with the poop emoji, because neighborhood, um, talks about how to give financially. Um, and on the back of this sheet, there are details about how to set up a gift online. It could be a recurring gift of any amount. Um, but we really do lean on those gifts to not only support the work in the ministry that Neighborhood Church does, but also to do things like turn on the lights in the morning and have a sound system that works and have clergy that we love. Um, so we really do count on each and every one of you to support in a way that feels comfortable um, for your lifestyle and for the ways that you would like to engage with this community. So I ask that each of you stop by the table before you leave, get a button that says thanks for giving, um, which is giving in any way that you feel comfortable, um, and learn a little bit more about the work that we're doing and how you can be engaged in a meaningful way. Thank you. Awesome. Friends, at this time, we are going to prepare to um, take up our offering. We invite you, as she was just talking, to give um, in the way in which you would like to. Friends online, there's a link coming if you would like to give virtually. And we invite you at this time to prepare your hearts and minds to give. Friends, let us pray at this time. Lord, we thank you for these gifts and for the talents and abilities of our community. Loving God for the time we have, will you say thank you? For the gifts we offer, will you say thank you? For the chance to help others, we say thank you. 
for the people whose lives will be better because of these gifts. Will you say thank you for the ways you are changing the world? Will you say thank you? We pray in the name of Jesus who appears wherever people need our help. Amen. And we say thank you. Friends, as we prepare to come to this table of grace, there is much uncertainty. And one thing we hope we can be certain about is that God's grace is real. And that this table is a glimpse of that grace and does exist somehow in the time beyond time. There's something about this table that takes us to some transcendent place and we believe as we talked about last week on All Saints that but through the power of the Holy Spirit and that Kairos time that everyone who has ever or will ever be part of the beloved children of God can gather at this table with us even in this moment here right now. So we invite you to find the little cards in your um, the bright colored pouches or on the little tables around the room um, or on the QR code or on the links online to follow along in our liturgy for communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, our Alpha and our Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And it's in you that we live and move and have our being. And even when we fell into sin, to the things that lead us away from love, you did not desert us. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke through prophets and teachers. And in Jesus Christ, your word became flesh, love embodied and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn singing together. Blessed is your child, Jesus Christ, the one who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own and filled them with a longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and uncertainty, and you destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for everyone for the, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as together we proclaim the mystery of faith, singing. I says I, I see.
I invite you to extend your hands as you are able or desire to be part of this blessing of the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this cup, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. As the grain and grapes once dispersed in the field are now united on this table in bread and in cup, so may we and all your people be gathered from every time and place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And all God's people sing. with the confidence of the children of God. Let's pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying it in whatever language is our heart and home language. Okay. Lord, 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 As you prepare to come to this table, you are welcome to come. It is for you. There's no membership requirements. There's no particular professions of faith or age requirement to be able to come and receive grace at this table. There will be a station here with cup and um, it's unfermented grape juice, gluten-free bread. We'll give you a piece of bread and you can dip it in the cup and take both elements together. I'll be over here at this station with the little tiny self-contained closed units that have unfermented grape juice and a tiny wafer. The wafer does contain some gluten. There's a prayer wall in the back you can add things to your to the prayers or take a moment to pray for things other folks have lifted up this is your time to be present with God and you are invited to do what is right for you to connect with God at this time so please come if you feel led We never left you We never left you that day We never left you Even though we feel far away Couldn't hold you But you didn't want to be held Anyway Love is pain. 
God, you can hear me. (laughs) Oh, God, thank you for this gracious mystery, for this time out of time in which we connect throughout time with all who love you and who you love. Oh, God of grace, send us out from this place, from this moment in time, out into the world, even into uncertainty, to go and to share love, to build hope, to develop relationships with our neighbors and strangers until there are no more strangers anymore. God, send us out to be your body, hard at work in this world, until we all feast together. At that moment again, outside of time. God, I pray and ask this in the name of Jesus, the one who is here with us and the one who will come and be with us forever. And all God's people said, amen. Friends, as you go, um, remember children, um, fifth grade and under, we hope you will stay and meet us right up here and hang out for Grow Kids. We have some fun stuff planned for this afternoon, and we hope you'll stay. Grown-ups, come check your kids in. Um, The rest of you, I hope you have something equally as fun to go do. Um, You you don't. Yes, sorry. You could try, but we're probably going to have more fun. But as you go out from this place, remember that even when you travel through uncertainty, God, who created you and called you good, Christ, who lived love so that you could know love, and the Spirit who makes even the impossible possible, go with you. So keep alert, friends. Trust that God is with you, and seek peace and joy and love. Amen.